you know, we're at the biggest bubble ever. Uh, this is bigger than tulip mania. Uh, for some of those who don't know, tulip mania was taking place as the first ever bubble to take place in financial history, financial market history. And, you know, it, 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 it's just like any other pump and dump scheme, right? So the price of tulips actually went to, I don't believe I remember the exact numerical figure, but it went so parabolically high and it was so overextended and all the government was doing was trying to suppress that by printing, you know, more, um, I mean, not printing by, uh, well, back then they had a bargain system. That was before the gold standard. The bargain system, all they tried doing was inflating their supply. So they had a stash that they can evolve out of over time, but that's not how it works. They need to let uh, companies fail. I'm talking in terms of today. The government needs to let people like Boeing and um, all you know these airlines, these cruise lines, they need to be let to be fail, okay? Because this is a free market. This is capitalism. That's not how the free market works. It doesn't just get taken out by the government because the government thinks they're so worthy for economic performance. What we need instead, guys and girls, is we need productivity. Productivity growth is the most important metric for economic performance. And frankly, the divergence, you know, I'm talking 2016, 2017, even 2018, and 2019, all of Trump's presidency, we saw that divergence. We saw sluggish economic data against a parabolically high financial market, uh, excuse me, stock market. Um, you know, and that's the last we've seen of it. And like I said in the beginning, the biggest pin of all pins popped this bubble. And at an extraordinary time, it happens, unfortunately, to be COVID-19 pandemic. Um, not to mention how we responded to it. I thought it was God awful. Um, but anyways, so the next question is, um, you know, how, how can we... Um, and there's a lot I didn't mention there, guys. I could go on this forever. The amount of sovereign debt um, that's been accumulated as well from foreign nations, because again, we're the largest creditor nation, uh, excuse me, largest debt nation in the world. Never used to be like that. We actually used to be the largest creditor in the world. We used to be... Um, but what happened to that was after FDR, everything came to shams. We had a short-term prosperity, but then governance, uh, government intervention came very much into play. And, you know, we, we did see, you know, the natural laws of crises um, proclaims much more than just globalization, the power of globalization, but very, very idiosyncratic effects. So individual you know, so systemic risk, right? The risk that the economy is going to fail. That systemic risk is aligned with idiosyncratic risk in a very interesting way. And I'll give you a very good example. In 74, just three years after the gold standard, we saw the oil shocks. And that shock was the epitome of all shocks in that time. The oil sector, not to mention the energy sector right now, we're seeing insolvency, high chances of insolvency, because of our current pricing war. Um, you know, so no matter how many barrels are cut, it really just comes down to, um, you know, will the Saudis and Russians and, um, you know, even Africa, will they, um, you know, will they actually stand up to um, this globalization effect, this tr kind of transparency and distribution of the demand, which there is no demand. Um, you know, I keep saying this, but demand and supply have been sabotaged. And what happens when that happens, demand and supply coincide. They coincide with each other um, in a very dangerous and volatile way, which we've seen. Um, that's why 20 million plus people are out of jobs. That's why interest rates are artificially low by the Fed. Um, there's too much that's still wrong here. And the Fed is still trying to artificially suppress the situation by floating more fake money into the system at the expense of the taxpayer, right? The taxpayer has to pay through this through inflation. But hold up, inflation has not risen above 2% in the past 10 years. So clearly, 
that's a clear example of artificialization within the federal government. They are literally keeping, um, you know, the, despite the fact their balance sheet has exploded over almost seven trillion dollars, and it's going to ten very soon. Um, you know, the amount of just credit versus how much we've saved as a country um, is tremendous. And it never used to be like that. In the 50s, we used to be the most prosperous, um, prosperous country in the world. That's when we had the title, the biggest creditor nation, um, you know, because we just had so much money we didn't know what to do with because we used our free market in the proper way. Um, right? We use the free market in a proper way. And there's no better way to treat a free market better than with capitalism. And unfortunately, government intervention has very much intervened that conception. Um, you know, so, it, you know, after World War II, after 1945, we saw nothing but prosperity for almost 20 years. Um, you know, through the 60s, we saw the conglomerate generation boom, uh, that was the start of conglomerates going big. Um, you know, and then the 70s, we started seeing shocks. And then that became a very much of a cyclical pattern. In the 80s, we saw interest rates rise to the teens, almost the 20s. In the 90s, we saw a little bit of leisure, but then consumer spending started to rise at dramatic rates. And then, of course, we saw 01 and 9-11. All right, that was, you know, that changed life forever um, in a very unfortunate way. Um, and then the 01 bubble, which is just another example of tulip mania, it's just another example. Any company with the name, um, you know, abc.com, um, xyz.com went public and they, um, and you know, their stock price just automatically, um, you know, parabolically flew to over uh, 500 plus percent on IPO day because people just got so excited by this dot com. Um, uh, uh, realization, they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong. It was a revolutionary effect. However, the sentiment was just like now, the sentiment was way over the top relative to how much things were actually worth. Because it came to a point where companies that went public, they weren't even companies. They were just websites. They were literally just intellectual property of a website domain that went public.